area under a curve where the curve is now the height of each rectangle is going to be represented by the um, value of each term in our series. So we're going to estimate the area under a curve with an integral. So your series is, let's say it's summation a k, k equals, you start at 0 or 1, doesn't really matter, to infinity. We're going to estimate using some function f of x which will equal ax for every x value. <clears throat> In this case, we're starting at 0. So for x equals 0, comma 1, 2, 3, et cetera, et cetera. So we're basically going to choose the function that is each individual term. So this function has the same value as the term for all the integer values of x, the starting at 0 or wherever your series starts. Some of them start at 2, 1, or 2, or 3, and in which case you would just use the x value starting at the appropriate 1. And the integral test, basically if this uh, integral converges, so the integral we're going to use, integral fx dx, and we're going to start from 0 to infinity, and let's actually change this 0 to a b. k equals b, so we'll start it at b and go b to infinity. And instead of starting at 0, we'll go b, comma. Now it's a little hard to write the numbers from b to infinity, so what I'm going to do is carefully do that now. So if you start at the number b, What's the integer, and assuming b is an integer, what is the next number? Oh, very good, b plus 1. What's the next one? b plus 2. Hopefully that's enough to see the pattern, and I can just go dot, dot, dot. So number b, next number, next number, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So whatever b is, doesn't even matter. And we just integrate from b to infinity, fx dx. Now you do not want to have vertical asymptotes in here. So if you have an f of x that has a vertical asymptote from b to infinity, this is not going to work. So you better not have a vertical asymptote. So this is assuming, so this assumes no vertical asymptote of f of x in the interval b to infinity. So we need just a normal function. And of course, how do we integrate this? We're going to go lim. So we need another number. We'll go c approaches infinity. Integral b to c fx dx. So that's how we're going to do this. So we're going to be using our improper integral, just going from the number b to some variable, and then send it to infinity. So this actual integral test, I'll write down right now. I'm going to underline it because it's important. So you do need a positive so we're going to suppose the ak is greater than or equal to 0 for all k. And so we're also supposing, and there exists this f of x that equals ax for all Let me write this slightly differently. So there exists f of x such that fk equals ak for all k. 
So I'm being lazy, whatever k values you start at, if you start at zero, it would be k equals one, zero, one, two, three, four, five to infinity. So it just needs to match up on the integer values. So if we suppose this, we have positive and it matches up. And f of x is greater than or equal to zero and decreasing. Now, if a function was positive and increasing, I believe it would automatically diverge in the integral. So if your function got bigger, then the integral would be infinity. So that's not necessarily needed here. If this function would be decreasing, it would be decreasing automatically if it converged. Um, decreasing. Then both summation a k to infinity and integral f x dx then both either converge or diverge. So what this means is they both behave the same. So we can turn a series problem into an integral problem. Of course, to integrate to infinity, we have a limit, but we know how to integrate, and we know how to take a limit after we integrate. So we can turn a series problem into an integral problem. So we're going to go do that right now. So first example, prove summation k equals 1 to infinity. 1 over k diverges. So aside from the integral test, we have only one other test really for convergence or divergence. What is the one test that we have from 10.2? Nth term. And what is the nth term? What could the nth term test tell us if we pass? It tells us only one thing. It can tell us if it diverges. Now, if you fail the nth term test, it tells you nothing. So it either tells you it diverges or it doesn't tell you anything. So it cannot tell you it converges. So the nth term test will only tell you, does it diverge, or do you have to do a lot more work? So one of the two. Does our particular series pass the nth term test for divergence? What happens, just look at the terms, do the terms go towards zero. Yep, so the nth term test tells us nothing. So we can't use it. So that's out. Good news is our second test, the integral test. So this is going to behave exactly like the 1 over x function from 1 to infinity. So we're going to use the integral test. So our series so the series right up here, this one behaves like integral 1 to infinity 1 over x dx. So our function f of x is 1 over x, and f of k equals 1 over k. So obviously it is the function that matches up with our terms right there. You're going to naturally, if you're paying attention, you're going to pick the function that is the same as the terms. You're just changing your k to an x. So nothing special is happening there. You do need to make sure it's going to be positive, but 1 over x is positive when x is positive. And we're going positive 1 to infinity. So no problem with negatives. I think we did this limit Friday? No, Thursday?
So we got infinity. It's basically a natural log, and then you take the uh, limit as natural log x goes to infinity. So you're going to get infinity. I'm pretty sure we did this. I think we did. All right, so this is infinity. So this, all this work we did, uh, this is from Thursdays. So work from previous class, previous class, previous class. All right, so by the integral test, this series diverges. It diverges uh, to infinity. So this is called the harmonic series. So now we're going to do a similar one. So we're going to find convergence or divergence for various p values. So our series summation, 1 over k raised to the p power, k equals 1 to infinity. So which power, what value of p did we already take care of with the previous example by saying 1 over k diverges? So we took care of p equals 1, and we said diverge. So we have three cases. I'll go case one, the one we already did. P equals one, we got divergence from above. So we just did that work up there. Case two, we'll go P greater than one. Case three, P less than one. So we did P equals one, there's two cases left. So we're going integral test, of course. What is our f of x function? You have to be a little careful because you have to put the variable in the right spot. So what's changing? Is k changing or p changing? k. So k is the variable. So it's going to look like 1 over x to the p, which you could write as x to the negative p, depending on how you want to write it. We're about to do calculus on this, so x to the negative p is probably more useful. Now we're going to integrate x to the negative p dx from 1 up to infinity. So this uses the power rule. This antiderivative uses the power rule for every p value except what's the only power that doesn't go? Follow the anti-power rule. Zero works. Negative one. Negative, negative one. Yes, negative one. Or one over x is the natural log. So that's the only one that doesn't follow the anti-power rule. We already took care of that. So now all you have to do is anti-power rule. So we're assuming p is not equal to one. So you don't have the natural log. So all you do is anti-power rule. All right, what does anti-power rule say about this integral? Well, actually, before I do that, let me flip this to be a limit c approaches infinity, integral 1 to c, x negative p dx. All right, anti-power rule. What is the antiderivative here? P 
So what is one more than negative P? Negative P plus one. Can I write it as one minus P? Does that work, one minus P? Divided by what number? One minus P. From one to C. Oh, not C to one, from one to C. One to C. All right, a lot of you look confused when I did that. I just added one to negative P. I wrote it as one minus P, but positive one plus negative P. So why is it important if P is greater than one or P is less than one? So one minus P is greater than zero when P is greater than one. That's important. So this is case two. Case two, we have this. Case three, what do we have in case three? Uh, P is less than one, so that means subtract, no, subtract P to this side. That means one minus P is, uh-oh, that's not good. P is greater than one. Ah, P should be less than one, not. So which one of my inequalities is wrong? I think this one is wrong. Yes. There we go. P is less than one, which is actually case three. All right, so P is less than one is case three. P is greater. Oh. Stupid inequalities. All right, so is that right for case three? P is less than one. Just subtract P, okay. So case two. P is greater than one, and subtract P. So we got one minus P is less than zero, negative. Okay, so there you go. Case two, case three. So let's finish up case three here. So you have c to the one minus p divided by one minus p minus one divided by one minus p. All right, one over one minus p is a number, so I don't care really what's happening with that number. That's going to stay about where it is. What about this first limit right here? C to the 1 minus P power. That's all I really care about. That divided by 1 minus P is just another number. So what is C to the 1 minus P? 1 minus P is a positive power. So what happens when that base gets bigger and bigger? Raised to a positive power. Infinity. So we have a base getting bigger and bigger raised to a positive power. Even if it was a small number like a half or a fifth, that would be a square root of infinity, fifth root of infinity. The reason I don't have uh, infinity to the zero power because one minus p is a number. It's not changing. So one minus p is not going to get closer to zero. It's some positive value. So this is going to infinity. And our limit is infinity minus whatever the number that is we get infinity. So that means case three diverges. So 
our case three is divergent. Let's do the same thing. So repeat the same process for case two. So rewrite our limit. C approaches infinity. So figure out what this one should be. So now you're, you have the opposite. 1 minus p is now negative, less than 0. Up here? Uh, I got the C right. That C from this C right here. So everything, in, until we plug in, in the actual endpoints, we are in X's. So this is like X equals 1 to X equals C, right? If I write in the, uh, those are really X values. So once you make that substitution, you should have no x's on your next step, or else something you, you missed an x somewhere. All right, so we get this right here, and we have c to the 1 minus p, but now 1 minus p is negative. So we have c to a negative power. So you think we have infinity to the 1 minus p over some number minus another number. This power is negative right here. But negative power is reciprocal, so we're going to get 1 divided by uh, whatever number that is, which is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So negative power reciprocal, which means this whole term is going to go to 0. So whatever the number 1 over 1 minus, or negative 1 over 1 minus p is, that's our value we're going to converge to. So we're going to converge here. So we got convergence on one of the cases and divergence on the other. And we did case two was converge. And case three was diverge. One thing you need to realize with the integral test, it tells you convergence, divergence, but it won't tell you which number you're converging to. So it's an estimation. So I should write that down. So warning. So they would both converge if you got convergence, but the convergence, the number you get is just an estimate. It's not the actual value. So the convergence of the integral it is only an estimation. Of the value that the series converges to. So what I could not say down here for convergence, I could not say converge to negative 1 over uh, 1 minus p. So I cannot make that claim right there. It'll be sort of close, but I cannot say it will be that number. So we'll converge, but I cannot say to what. So this is called a p-series. So let's write that down. 
This is a P series, a first special series, aside from geometric. So it is summation 1 over k. It's usually written. There's two ways to write it. I believe the regular way is to put the 1 over k, just raise the k to the p power. Usually they're started at 1. Why would 0 be a bad number to start k here? Be undefined. So you wouldn't want to start at 0 or any negative numbers, but start it at 1 or any bigger numbers, you're fine. You may see it written, this is just the simplest of algebra, you may see it ri written like this. So this will converge when p is greater than 1, diverge when p, not just less than 1, but less than or equal to 1. So diverges at 1 and all the smaller p values. Super important series. I think it should go on your cheat sheet. You don't need to write both forms on your cheat sheet. Whatever the two forms works better for you. All right, so a piece of warning. So according to what we just wrote, 1 over k equals infinity. So how far do you think you have to go to hit 20, which is not a very large number? So if it goes to infinity, you certainly have to pass the number 20 on the way there. How many terms do you think you need to pass 20? Remember, your first, your first number is 1. Your second number is 1 half. Then 1 third. Then a fourth. Then a fifth. Then a sixth. It takes a little while to even hit 2. So in order to hit 20, according to this, you need 178 million terms. So yes, it does go to a million, but you have to have a lot of patience, or it does go to infinity, but you have to have a lot of patience to hit even the number 20. So I think you can see number 21 would take a whole lot longer to hit 22, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're bored, you just figure out how many does it take to hit the number three. The answer is quite a few. Okay. Uh, I'm only bringing this up because if you start adding terms, you see it looks like they're really not getting that big that quickly. The answer is yes, they're not getting that big that quickly. So you add the first thousand terms, you're going to be nowhere near 20. And it may look like it's not going to pass some numbers. But this one is deceptive that you do have to go out really far to hit 20. That's the end of integral test. So next up are the comparison tests. So we're going to go for the one that you won't use very often first, and then we'll go for the super useful one, which is a limit comparison test second. So the first one is a little less, less useful. It's just called the comparison test. So we're going to suppose that we have this inequality, 0 less than or equal to ak less than or equal to bk less than or equal to ck. So I could write for all k, but I want to just say for all k that are large. So for all k greater than some big n value. So this will be just for some big number n. So we have our terms lined up. A's are little, B's are medium, and C's are large. 
So if we know our terms are lined up like this, So let's say you know that the sum of CK converges. This double right arrow means implies. Have I used that before? I think I've used that a few times. So if you know that adding up all these CKs converges, meaning it's a finite number, what could I say about BK, about the sum of all the BKs. And let's forget about where K starts. That's not important. So if you know all the bigger ones add up to a finite number, what could you say about series? So it's got to converge also. So we've got a smaller one. So sum of BK converges. I could say that AK converges also, but we're just going to, we really just want to make conclusions about this BK, series of BKs. So separately, what if you knew that AK diverges? So the little one added up to infinity. What would you say about adding up all the BKs? Completely different scenario. So completely different series. But you know something smaller adds up to infinity. Yeah, this will add up to infinity or more. So infinity. So if the little one diverges and you know your terms are all bigger, you have to diverge also. And if you've got some series that's bigger, all the terms are bigger and it converges, then all of your terms have to converge too. So let's do one example where this will work. So we'll go 5 over 5k minus 1. So I need to find a series to compare to. So we're looking for a comparison. So what's good to compare this to? Do you think that minus 1 really matters when k is a million? Nope. So let's try to compare to 5 over 5k, which is 1 over k. Oh, that's pretty familiar. Now the question is, and we know, we just saw 1 over k diverges. So we just saw 1 over k diverges. This is only going to be good if that inequality is true, the one I just wrote down. If 5 over 5k is less than 5 over 5k minus 1. So that inequality I just wrote down, if that's true, we got our literal series diverges, so our big one has to diverge. Does that make sense? We got a little series on the right, 1 over k. We know diverges. So if this one is less than 5 over 5k minus 1, then our series is going to diverge. So fractions are difficult. So how in the world can I go show this? You could try to use intuition and say, hey, numerators are both 5. Denominators, which one has the smallest denominator? 5k minus 1 which means your denominator is smaller, so your fraction is bigger. So denominator smaller, fraction is bigger. So this inequality is true.
Now we would have a huge problem if that minus one was a plus one. Our comparison test would be absolutely useless. So this one worked out because it was minus. If it was plus, comparison test would not be useful at all here. All right, so that diverges. So by the comparison test, our original series must diverge also. What the limit comparison test will allow us to do is take a limit of these two. And if the limits are equal, then we can say they behave the same. So taking a limit, that minus one doesn't mean anything. So these two in a limit would behave exactly the same. So last regular comparison test. After this problem, you can pretty much forget the comparison test. We're going to use the limit comparison test. So the last problem we're going to do with the regular comparison test. This is one of the first times we see factorials in use. Well, you saw it on your quiz, I think. All right, nth term test. Is that going to prove divergence automatically? What happens when k is really big? It's going to go to 0. So divergence test is going to tell us nothing. So this terms are getting small. So it's got a shot at converging, but we need to actually check. So this estimation we're going to use is not obvious. So let's write out the first few terms. k is 1, we have 1 over 1. k is 2, 1 over 2 times 1. k is 3, 3 times 2 times 1, plus 1 over 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, plus I'm going to write the kth term down, k times k minus 1 times 2 times 1. So you don't have to write the kth term down. I just wanted to give some idea of what it looks like. So I could write a k as 1 over 2 times 3 times 4 times dot 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 times k. So why is this estimate true? Maybe a non-fraction would be a better way to look at this. So if I take the reciprocal, when you take reciprocals, your inequality sign flips around. So I'm going to reciprocate both sides. So this is the same inequality as 2 times 3 times 4 dot 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 times k is greater than or equal to 2 to the k. Now, I have to be a little bit careful because technically there's k minus 1 right here total, not k. Maybe we'll go k minus 1 just to be a little safe. So, why is this inequality true? The right side is just 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. That's exactly right. All right, so the right side, the small side, is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. The left side is 2 times numbers that are bigger than 2. So it's definitely bigger. All right, now we have this. Now we believe this inequality without fractions. All we do is reciprocate both sides of the inequality. So that's not difficult, just reciprocal both sides, and that flips your inequality. So you've seen reciprocals and inequality. 
the quality is flipping around. So like two is bigger than three, but one half and one third have the opposite relationship. So let's go ahead and add up this right here. Summation, one over two to the k minus one. K minus one from k equals one to infinity. How can I rewrite this as a perfect geometric series? It is a geometric series, but how do I rewrite it? Yep, so we'll go k equals zero to infinity. So we brought k back one, so we have to basically add one to compensate. So good news is that looks like just one over two to the k. So it makes it look really geometric. And you could write it now one half to the k power. And you finish your quiz, so you know this is 1 over 1 minus a half, which is 2. So it converges to 2. So this is a convergent geometric series. So we have something bigger converges. So what can I say about our small series? Also has to converge. So we got one that was bigger, added up to two. So our series has to add up to something two or less, between zero and two. So by the comparison test, summation one over k factorial, k equals one to infinity converges. So you're always going to be using the next test, which is limit comparison. And we'll do that one tomorrow. Way more useful.